my word has to be peace. It's remarkable to me that this country has not only risen up to become such a global superpower, but also a remarkable country domestically, but that it has done so in peace. This is an unprecedented experience in the history books. I think that what underpins everything here that we've discussed and the phrase I would go for is cultural confidence. And I think that's sweeping across China. There's a renewed desire, confidence in local culture, expressing yourself through that culture. I think it's a real genuine trend amongst Chinese people and consumers. I would say in 2023, the first one is a recovery, and that is a very important year for the recovery of the economy and also the openness. And the second is uh, artificial intelligence. So I do believe that these things is changing or has changed a lot about the industries and sectors in China and around the world. The Chat Lounge. Chat Lounge. Chat Lounge. The Chat Lounge unpacks views and opinions on hot issues in a more casual way. Welcome to the Chat Lounge. I'm your sitting host, Ge Anna. New productive forces, the far, far ahead, special forces-style tourism. Over the past week, several media outlets have unveiled compilations of China's top buzzwords for the year 2023. Throughout this year, a myriad of Chinese buzzwords have surged through diverse facets of society, leaving an indelible mark on trends and behavior and reflecting the dynamic cultural shifts in modern China. From profound social commentary to the peaks of consumerism, how can these buzzwords serve as a distinct lens into the evolving Chinese zeitgeist? How have they reshaped perceptions of China's global economic and cultural influence? Let's delve into these defining terms that have not only dominated conversations, but also signified broader societal and market trends in China this year with Mike Basting, China Observer and a Senior Lecturer with the University of Southampton in the UK, Mario Cavallo, Founder and CEO of M Communications Group and a Senior Fellow of the Center for China and Globalization, and Dr. Zhou Mi, Senior Research Fellow of the Institute of World Economy at Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Hello. Our first buzzword is new productive forces or Li, which means using groundbreaking and cutting edge technologies to foster new industries, new models and growth drivers. The term became quite trending and garnered significant tension during and after this year's Central Economic Work Conference. It was brought up earlier this year when President Xi Jinping's inspection tour of Heilongjiang. So Dr. Zhou Mi, let me begin with you. As a senior economist, what does new productive forces mean in the context of China in 2023 and beyond? And how does the EU represent a departure from traditional growth paths of China? In my understanding that when we're talking about this new world, actually I noticed that, that the phenomena has become one of a new trend that China is not only trying to follow the, the traditional ways of development, but trying to find out some better way. But I don't think that is because China really just, uh, we want to do that. It is because that the world is changing. There are so many new things, so many new trends, new technology, and also a lot of things have changed for the international rules. And governance issues. So actually, we are not trying to repeat what other countries have done in the past decades. We are trying to find out some of the new elements or new kind of ways for the better development. China is in that stage of, uh, you know, transforming from our economy of, uh, you know, based on the traditional manufacturing into our country, which is uh, a little bit more dependent on the innovative elements. So the innovation is really shaping the world and China is very active trying to be take part in that process. I, I think that this concept is not a totally new thing for China to just uh, jump from one, uh, one uh, place to another. We are trying to make a better use of the innovative elements and trying to be better in that position. That is my understanding about this new world. About this new word, how does the Chinese government intend to realize this concept in the coming period? 
you know, there are so many uh, so many discussion about the high quality development. The high quality development not only you know happened in the domestic economy, but also for the international trade and investment. So I think that for the new. Uh, productive ways of uh, to giving more support to the development. I think that we are trying to improve the environment as a first step. And we are trying to make a better uh, regulations and the laws to adapt to the new uh, development on the innovative ways of um, connecting everything. And we are giving our better environment for the businesses to operate in China, no matter where country, uh, which country they come from. So I think that is the first step. And the second, that we are trying to help to establish that better uh, multinational corporations to use these innovative ways to deal with uh, uh, real e economy. I think that is one of the most important things. So we encouraging not only the big companies, but some of the smaller one, but with uh, better technology or some advantages in the innovative ways of development, like the green economy and digital economy. But the third one, I think that is uh, also important that the consumers are inspired to trying to consume more things, not only the products, but also some of the services mm -hmm. to do with a new area that is very important. Mm -hmm. Mario, how do you interpret the term and the trending of this term? Uh, how significant and necessary of this for China? Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this. I'll expand from Dr. Joe's points into the domestic and international spectrum. You know, of course, the the first remarkable point about how all of these new forces, all of these new technologies, and how they're all coming together in an unprecedented way. I mean, it's never happened before. And China is at the leading edge of integrating them all together, far ahead of the European Union far ahead of the United States, and I'm speaking of the domestic situation, as Dr. Joe mentioned. But I'm also looking at it internationally. And in the international marketplace, I think the effect of what's happening is frightening the Western powers. They see China forging ahead internationally. Now, I'll repeatedly talk today about how, you know, the Western forces, starting with the United States, are, are trying to stop China from doing that. However, the fact of the matter is, is that while all of these things are happening, these new, all of these new productive forces are happening domestically, let's not forget that they are also being exported internationally into other markets. And so imagine, it's not only, for example, to say that China is helping the African continent develop, they're building bridges, you know, infrastructure and bridges, ports and rails and hospitals and education. I mean, they're building it. But it's different to say if this was China helping build out Africa, say, 35, 40 years ago, when all of these new productive... That would be fine, too. But back then, none of these new productive forces existed. So for China to be doing this now, to be exporting and expanding into other markets with these same new productive forces, that's the point that's, uh, that's on my mind for today. Mm -hmm. Michael, what's your perspective? Because China has been considered the world's largest manufacturing country, contributing 30% to the global added value in this realm. Now, with its transition to high-end manufacturing, what role will the new productive forces play? I think so. In, in many ways, the, the words, the, or the word new is, not, is a bit misplaced, really, because as the other panelists have said, this is it's really more of the same, I think. I think it's noteworthy that um, President Xi Jinping made this comment on a trip to Dongbei, to northeast China, obviously the sort of heavy industry, Rust Belt, we think of cars, Chongqing. Uh, and I think he, he was really just reinforcing the fact that this, the low-cost manufacturing base that really fueled China's miraculous, it has to be said, miraculous economic uh, transformation going back sort of in the 80s and 90s is a thing of the past. And we have to move on and keep moving on to these new productive forces, i.e. information technology, investment in, in, in high tech and innovation. And, and that really is the way forward. And a key indicator I think you're alluding to here is the emergence of internationally uh, renowned, high premium, manufactured and also service Chinese brands. And I think that's really what, what um, 
what it's all about for me. So these new productive forces are about establishment of Chinese brands on the international stage and Chinese uh, manufacturing, Chinese design, uh, high-tech design in particular. That is the sort of the rivals, competitors around the world. And we're seeing that now with new energy vehicles. My particular industry, in particular fashion as well, Chinese fashion designers are, are internationally renowned now more and more. So I think that really, for me, is, is what it's all about. It's about premium brands, high technology, investment and innovation. But more than anything, it's about these younger generations, younger generations of Chinese uh, consumers, but also producers who, who will take China to that next step forward. So I think that really is where the focus is on. And, and it's not really anything that, that seems to be happening for quite a few years now. So I think more of the same. Let's wait and see the changes, this trend, and a new focus brought to China. Gentlemen, our exploration continues with the next buzzword, two-way efforts, a concept embodying collaborative endeavors and shared objectives, particularly evident in improved China-U.S. relations. Let's unravel the significance of this phrase. Mario, before that, how would you summarize Sino-U.S. relations in 2023? Yeah, my take on this is the problem, frankly, is despite the effort, and and there has been two-way efforts this past year. Uh, We'll we'll talk about what some of those have been. But this is going to be blunted by the ongoing negative situation, which is going to become worse. It already has started because we're heading into the election year in the United States. So, this is when uh, the candidate must speak with nationalistic fervor and must champion that we are better than and must beat and hold back the enemy. And that number one enemy is China. I mean, and that, that's how they get votes. The new president, Millet, just did it in Argentina. And it's almost comical that voters could be so naive. He spent the month leading to the election, bashing China, acting as a U.S. puppet. And then two days after he was elected, he began his a complete about-face, a complete flip, his you know, warm sharing of words of cooperation with China, because he knows he needs, they need China. They can't do without China. So there's not an easy answer here, but, but look, I have to say it this way. The problem, frankly, is that it's not good, period. It's not good at all. And on the on the quiet side, yes, I'll go along with this phrasing of two-way efforts. And the two-way efforts are happening behind the scenes, and they are happening. You've got the trade people meeting. They're all meeting. They're keeping the gears of conflict oiled so that we don't have an economic meltdown. We have a very nice situation in that regard but it's in the background. So the, the politicians on the American side will never openly, publicly champion and talk about how important and good it is for us to get along with China. It's just not going to happen. I'll stop there and let, let the conversation But Mario, earlier on the same day when California Governor Gavin Newsom concluded his visit to China, Harry Moyer, a veteran pilot of the American Flying Tigers, celebrated his 103rd birthday in China. Because back in 1944, he flew a series of missions with his team in Sichuan, working with the Chinese military and people to fight invading Japanese troops. Many believe people-to-people exchanges at grassroots level have played a big role in promoting China-U.S. relationship and preventing it from derailing. As an American living in China, you have also made remarkable efforts and contributions in people-to-people exchanges between the two nations. How do you see the impact of such personal narratives on fostering positive China-U.S. relations today? Yeah. In private circles, everyone knows, agrees, and understands that the personal relationships and the efforts like you're referring to need to continue. Um, I, I was very happy. For example, two weeks ago, I was invited to be one of the speakers at the Basa uh, Peace Forum in Zhujiangyan in, in Chengdu. And it, again, it's all about peace and friendship between the countries. And so at the business level, 
uh, at the lower levels. Uh, we all know this is true, and, and most everyone is friendly and is making that effort. And I love the story of, uh, of the of pilot, Harry Moyer, because I visited that island in Chongqing mm-hmm. where the, the Flying Tigers uh, American barracks and the Chinese uh, pilot barracks were, were shared on the island. We, we toured that last year. That, that's an amazing story, which, you know, unfortunately didn't continue. Um, but so that's my answer. Is that yes, it, these relationships more on the personal level, private arrangements, things that are happening. I'm a member of the American Chamber of Commerce and all American Chamber expats, all of our families. were so many of us living here for how many years, right? And we're all promoting and happy to be here. There's no, we don't want anything to do with the Washington base of politics. And so behind the scenes, it is positive. That's the good things that are happening. And I, in the end, believe that they will continue to happen, despite what we see happening on the surface. Yes, such communications, as opposed to some of the baleful rhetoric of Washington's politicians, is more effective in fostering a genuine understanding between the two countries. Dr. Zhou, what's your take? On the China-U.S. relations, with efforts and small acts of goodwill from both sides, in some degree, that the relation between these two nations are very important, not only for the people of both sides, but also for the other countries.、Mm. If you are looking at the summit in San Francisco this year, you may find that after the meeting between the leaders, the Chinese leaders also meet with、uh, Japanese、uh, leader. So I think that、uh, a lot of other countries are just watching what is happening between these two nations, whether there will be some better factors or a better train for the more cooperation. So they found that they are. More than 20 mechanism have been established by you know the, the two countries. So they are trying to do more in the cooperation to fighting against the challenges, the global challenges that especially mentioned in the Europe and the United States. So when I want to talk about the relation between these two sides, I think there are so many factors, especially for the state level of、uh, United States and the provincial level in China. There are so many opportunities, and、uh, the enterprises are trying. To cooperate with each other, and the people are really like to communicate with others. So you may still find there are so many Chinese students want to go to study in the United States colleges, and I I think that vice versa, we are trying to invite more than fifty thousand students or young people coming from United States to China in the coming years. So we believe, still believe that there are so many possibilities for both countries to cooperate in a, a much wider range. Instead of just the competition, but I have to say that the competitions are still there. I I agree that there are so many attitudes from the Washington towards China's development, but I don't believe that will cover everything. So I still trust that you know we 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 can do more things by the exchange and also the meetings of the peoples of both countries, and that is. Definitely important for us and for other countries in the world.、Mm-hmm. Mike, what's your thoughts on this? As we are talking about individual interactions and grassroots level connections, contribute to the promotion and、uh, resilience of the China-U.S. relations. I, I think I, re- I echo the, some of the comments made by the other panelists. I, I certainly value very highly. You use the word grassroots and on the ground、um, interaction exchange. Uh, with sort of ordinary people, members of the public, on various exchange programs, whether those are study programs、uh, between America and China, and also China and the rest of the world, I think those are very, very healthy, and those are only going to grow.、Uh, and I think what I've seen in the last few years is a real、um, fascination with China, Chinese history, Chinese culture around the world, much, much more so. So I, I think on on, the, on that grassroots level, I think things are very, very healthy. Uh, and I think that will continue and grow, and also contribute to better relations generally. I think at the political level, the leadership level, the, the issue for me is that it, you know, the Americans really just have to get used to the fact that they're not the sole superpower in, in the global economy anymore, and that is not going to change. That's not going to come back. That you know, that those days are over. 
Uh, and I think over time that will gradually seep into the American psyche or the psyche of the leaders. And I think that that will lead to a thaw in relations, as Biden um, alluded to recently, uh, and, and a much more um, acceptance on the American side that we, we need to work with China and, and other countries much, much more. Uh, and and that, that there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's not uh, nothing to be feared. I think that that's still there a little bit, that this sort of new kid on the block. Um, but really, that is a very, very good thing for the global economy. So, I, 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 you know, I'm quite positive, quite optimistic um, next year and beyond uh, U.S.-China relations. And at the grassroots level, I think that will carry things forward quite significantly. I, mean, I work with a lot of uh, international students, Chinese students. Uh, and, and there, the exchange and the interaction and the desire to get to know each other and work together and learn from each other is just growing and growing, which is you know, really perhaps uh, the way forward for, for, for relations generally. Right. Differences between the two countries existed in the past, exist now, and will continue in the future. The key is willing to find a common ground. Amario, as you said earlier, the China-U.S. relationship has gone through a bumpy journey in the past several years. But this term, the two-way efforts, has been selected as one of the buzzwords of 2023 in China. What does this say about Chinese people's attitude towards the U.S., especially in people-to-people exchanges today? Oh, the Chinese people's attitude toward what's happening. Um, they're really, you know, I, I, as you know, I live here a long time. And uh, by the way, Mike, you mentioned about Xi Jinping making some of these announcements when he was visiting here in the north, in the northeast. He was in Harbin. And, uh, I'm here in Shenyang. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been up here for six years. It's my wife's hometown. And so, you know, I do have these conversations with local Chinese all the time. And they are just surprised. That that's the only word that I could think of to use. They're just surprised. They don't understand what, what it is. What is all this? They can't believe the negative things that they're being said about them and their country. They're just like, what is going on? It's just crazy. Why is all this crazy stuff happening back in America? And why are they and saying all of these nasty, crazy things about us and about the government? I mean, everything is in, here in China is a normal country. And that's the emphasis that I always talk about is to make sure everybody, people don't understand because they don't live in a normal country. They live in a country with a lot of chaos and instability and divisiveness. So they automatically project that out. And when I tell them, well, we don't have any of the well, very little anyway. We don't have hardly any at all of that divisiveness and chaos and instability here in China. We just live in a normal society. People walk in and out of their houses without worrying about safety. Uh, there's no crazy behavior from people who are uh, disturbing the peace, disturbing the public, disturbing other people. And the Chinese just can't understand. They really have a hard time locally, the ones that I speak with, understanding what's going on. They're just kind of incredulous. And that being said, you know, I, I have to finish this this particular part by saying there's nothing good about the situation. The problem is, frankly, that I, I believe that the United States would destroy tomorrow, destroy China tomorrow if they could. <laughs> I do. They, they would like to stop China if they could. They'd stop them tomorrow. But they can't because they know that the damage would be as Mike said, it's too late. It would be catastrophic worldwide. They, they don't really care about good relations. They care about nothing beyond attaining and maintaining as much power and control as possible under a given set of circumstances. And that's the United States. That's what they do. That's their strategy. That's their foreign policy. It's not good. And we have to end this on a negative note in terms of this particular item. This is the reality of the situation. They don't want to be friendly. <laughs> They want to, they want power. Wow. <laughs> mm-hmm. Then let's hope that the two-way efforts can bring about a more rational perspective among certain Washington politicians regarding the development of China-U.S. relations and the mutual benefits it can bring to the people of the two nations. You've been listening to the Chat Lounge on CGTN Radio with me, Ge Anna, in Beijing. Let's take a short break. Coming back, we'll continue our discussion on China's top buzzwords of 2023. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the chat lounge with Mika Anna in Beijing. We've been talking about China's top buzzwords of 2023. Gentlemen, let's move on to the next buzzword. Far, far ahead, a phrase coined by Huawei's CEO to emphasize China's technological progress. This term has gained positive connotations, especially. After the release of a Huawei's smartphone Mate 60 Pro, let's discuss how this rallying cry reflects China's technological improvements and global competitiveness. Mike, before the U.S. imposed restrictions on Huawei, the company had cultivated its presence in the U.K. and European markets for decades, and contributing to the infrastructure development in the region. But unfortunately, due to shifting political dynamics, such collaborations have become limited. So, against this backdrop. How do you perceive the technological breakthroughs in Huawei's new flagship smartphones? I think it's very, very significant. As you say, Huawei, and not just Huawei, but also Lenovo and Chinese high technology, has really made its mark globally. So I think it's very, very significant. And I think in this phrase, this, this buzzword, it's more than a buzzword. I think reinforces that, and it really makes the, the message clear that we're going to see more of the same, and that's the way forward. So. You know, Huawei for for a long time, when it came to consumer electronics, Chinese brands were price competitive, but perhaps not perhaps up there when it came to when it came to the latest innovation, the latest technology. That's changed. That's been changing for a long time, and that really has changed. And when you go into, let's say, you go into a store now, you will see Huawei, you will see Lenovo, and there will be a real appreciation of a premium brand. That is really rivaling, as we see in the in the news. I think it's very significant that Huawei's technological advance is really leading the you know what we discussed at the start of the, the show, leading this new productive forces, the technological advance of brand China generally. We're seeing the new China, the China that people didn't think really existed going back not that many years. I can remember teaching in China, going back quite a few years, and telling. Telling my students it won't be too long before we do see a Chinese Apple, they couldn't believe it. I said, "Well, no, that's changing, and that will change." Dr. Joe, any thoughts? In what ways does this phrase serve as a rallying cry for China's technological progress, especially in narrowing the gap between China's semiconductor technology and that of the Western world? Yeah, in my understanding, that、uh, when we're talking about the, the differences between the technology of Huawei's products and the Apple, so they have done some comparison, and they found that、uh, the Huawei has leading you know, the version of Apple, the iPhones for quite a while because they are they are not only trying to make the deeper or you know in that dimension that already there, they are expanding new areas, providing the consumers with better experiences on using the. Telephones, and actually, in my understanding, that is the companies who should do that because they really want to address the challenges of the consumers and trying to make a better use of the technology. I think it's not that easy because、uh, Huawei is under the export control and some of the other kind of the limitation by the leading country in the world. So it's not so easy for them to trying to find out the space. That is a really a very、uh, surprising to. Me and also many other people in the world that Huawei has actually finished or accomplished this goal. I think that is based on the concept that they are not only limited on the nowadays、uh, technology; they are trying to discover or explore more things from the very basic technology and also theories in the physics, in the mathematics. And actually, they are not doing the things for the companies. Their own interest, but also trying to provide a better understanding and technology and criteria or for the global sectors and industries. I think that is very important for us to understand that a company is not working as a, just a private company; is serving as a, the development of the technology to benefit the related persons and also by the cooperation with other companies to benefit the the supply chains stakeholders. In my understanding. Understanding that is what Huawei is doing. Actually, it was forced to do that, and it has prepared many years ago for possible or, or you know the pressure from other countries. So I don't think that they give up. They trying to do some 
very special ways of the development, which has never been seen before by any other countries and, and other companies. So I don't think that they are just uh, make it, uh, you know, just a, a lesson, but also trying to use this as an opportunity window to have a better performance to serve the people and to create bigger ideas for the uh, real uh, electronics for the consumers. Speaking of that, and Huawei, the company in the bigger picture, Picture. When we talk about the far, far ahead, Dr. Zhou, what does it signify for China's competitiveness or China's position in the global tech landscape? Yeah, in my understanding, that we are not so leading many of the very leading technology, like for the uh, semiconductors, for very small chips to make. But actually, our advantage is also very obvious. That is based on you know the innovative ways of the spirit of the consumers. They really want to try new things for the products and all the services. So that giving much more opportunities for the innovative companies. But the second is that we have such a large Large market. The market are provided so many diversifications or different amounts, and that is providing uh, the companies to to try to explore uh, many different areas. And the third one, I I would say that is based on the manufacturing basis and also the supply chains, and that is uh, you know one of our advantages and. Uh, by the way, I have to say that China is cooperating with so many other countries, and many countries are looking at China as one of the examples. Maybe they can follow. So the cooperation not only based on the on the trade and investment, but also on the innovative way or technological cooperation. So they are really stronger and more resilient. So we are talking about the future. I, I believe that uh, technology of Chinese companies are still very. Promising, and you may find many good examples in different areas, like for the e-commerce or other areas. And we we are trying to cooperate and continue to follow up with the the leading technology and trying to make it better, like the artificial intelligence is one of the examples we may look at. Mm-hmm. Mario, I remember you are a user of Huawei smartphones, right? How do you perceive this far, far ahead, particularly after the release of Mate 60 Pro? Yeah, Mike mentioned it. You know, for Huawei, it's more, it's, it's not just a company. Huawei is really the symbol. Huawei is the one that the United States went after and came close to destroying. I mentioned it earlier. This is what they want to do. I mean, they would have been perfectly happy to have learned that Huawei decided to close its doors and go out of business. But by the way, none of this is unusual. They did this to Japan. And they did this to Toshiba. I mean, they did this to all some. This, this is what they do. And so Huawei winning, overcoming the odds, just added to the Chinese pride. There is this rise in national pride in China because the Chinese do know and understand that this country is rising and doing very well, relatively speaking. But none of them are that bad compared to other countries. And not only that. But the point that I'm strongly always mentioning is that China is not only rising and has become a global superpower, but has done so rising in peace. They haven't been involved in any wars or military attacks against any other country in decades. In fact, they've never started a war with any other nation. So Huawei's the symbol, really the, an emotional symbol, because. They represent this amazing, wonderful victory. Mm-hmm. Gentlemen, let's talk about our next buzzword: special forces style tourism, a trend gaining momentum in China's cultural and tourism consumption scene. This approach emphasizes efficiently exploring diverse tourism offerings within a budget-friendly framework, especially among young people in China. According to data from Tongcheng Travel, during just one day of the Qingming Festival holiday, 62% of post-2000s generation tourists chose to depart for their destination at night and spend a whole day of visiting scenic spot, and 30% of them managed to visit more than four scenic spots in a single day. Let's uncover how this trend reflects changing travel preferences and its impact on local economies. Dr. Zhou, have you ever experienced this special forces style tourism? How does it differ from traditional travel approaches in your opinion? 
Yeah, actually, uh, in my understanding, I, I do uh, experience such a kind of ways of uh, doing the tourism. I, I think the reasons are very simple because we don't have enough time, especially when you are able to travel with not only yourself, but also your family. So you have to plan the time with uh, more efficient ways. And we can have uh, so many uh, possible support from the logistics. So nowadays, you can find that uh, the sea trips and also some other platforms are provided you know, the rented cars. So it's very easy for the person to design a much more busy schedule for the tourism to travel. And you can connect these different places by the trains, also the high-speed trains. And they are really providing the possibilities for, you know, the actually the space force tourism to happen. And the third, I, I think that is also coming from the government and local government that really try to help the tourism to to go there places. So like at the beginning of this year for the spring festival holidays, I traveled to, to Guizhou, one of the provinces in China, and they have uh, making the first entrance for the main gate, the ticket free. So we have arranged the, the travel in a very tight schedule. I think that is also one reason that we can try to add more experiences that we can have for the very limited time. Mm-hmm. Mike, do you have any personal experiences or a story that captures the spirit of this new travel trend, special forces style tourism? Well, yes, yeah, certainly I'm, I'm aware of um, my Chinese students and their travel plans. and They have adapted those plans, certainly across China, but also across Europe, where they pack in a lot of, of countries, a lot of cities in a very short space of time on a shoestring budget. So I think that's been there for a while. I think this is partly to do with coming out of COVID. But I think it's a little bit more than that. I think what we're also seeing is a change in attitudes and values and lifestyles amongst younger Chinese consumers, particularly when it comes to travel, where it's much more about adventure. It's much more about sort of traveling off the beaten track. And I think that's consistent with a change in consumption generally. So younger Chinese consumers are less materialistic, are less prone to conspicuous consumption and less showy. It's more about an individual self-reward identity that's driving consumption, in this case, travel and budget travel. Mm -hmm. Mario, have you or your family members experienced the Special Forces style tourism? What does the popularity of this trend reveal about changing preferences and expectations among Chinese travelers? Yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, And and I'll make the joke and say I'm the victim of it. (laughs) (laughs) Tell us about this. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but no, but I understood. And my wife did it. We had our the characteristics of what Professor Joe and, and Mike just said, that you know, you're on a limited time frame mm-hmm. and you want to see more places and do it on a budget. We did that. We spent the recent October holiday, and it was six days. We were limited. We were able to grab some good airfares to Hong Kong, which was terrific from Shenyang. Then my wife, as wonderful as she is, the English phrase is to say she had us running around like chickens with our head chopped off. You know, we were just going everywhere. And and we, we had to pack it all in. She wanted to pack it all in. And it was a function of that. You know, we're in Hong Kong. Oh, right. So we got to hop on the catamaran over to Zhuhai. And we've got to go to Macau. And we've just got to do all of these things. And so it wasn't very relaxing, but it was a whole lot of fun. We got to see a whole bunch of great stuff, you know, and that is the style. There's one other point I want to make. I think this is being driven by budget. And also, people are choosing a certain type of holiday, which is to say, we could spend four days at a five-star hotel, or we could spend four days running around and see a lot more things on a budget. And they're choosing the latter. And one of the reasons they were choosing the latter is because as I have traveled out to Hong Kong and to the United States, where we hadn't traveled for over four years because of the pandemic, And guess what? We have made the um, very unpleasant discovery that so many things, including hotel rooms, are now 50 percent higher than they were two years ago. And so it's not a matter anymore of going to Hong Kong and saying, well, I want to stay at the the Langham or I want to stay at the Mandarin. And and you think you're going to get a hotel room for 1,800 RMB a night, and you're not. They're now 2,800, 3,200 RMB a night. And so you say, well, wait a minute. If that's the case, well, let's not do that. Let's have a different kind of vacation. Inflation 
have had a lot to do with it, I believe, as well, for people who are look, wanting to stretch their travel dollar. Dr. Joe Mario just mentioned that the pandemic played a bigger role in shaping the trend, but with the resumption of flights, this year has witnessed a surge in Chinese tourism, both domestically and internationally. So, in your opinion, what are the changes in travel perceptions or habits? Do you think the past three years of the pandemic have brought for the Chinese people? Yeah, first I would say that、uh, people are really eager to go out. You can find the data from the first、uh, holidays after the you know the change of the policies to do with、uh, COVID, and you may find that so many people are really want to go out. Even they, even they do only have maybe one day or two days. They they still trying to go somewhere to have a look at what what has happened or changed in the past three years. And the second, I would say that is you know、uh, many Chinese local governments are trying to provide a better environment for the tourism. From the news, we know that China has established the national park systems, and、uh, they are、um, trying to make a better use of the resources, like for the tropic forest in Hainan province, some places in the in the Hubei and Sichuan. So they are providing more experiences, and that is one of the things that we can expect to have. And the third, I would say that there are so many man-made or you know places for the people to to go. Like in Beijing, there are Universal Studio. They are、uh, att- attracting so many tourism from other country, and also from other provinces in China. So they are giving people more experiences for the not the natural things, but also some of the historic things or some of the, for the in- entertainment. So actually,、uh, I think that there are diversities of the you know different choices, and the people are really trying to have a much more diversified. Consumption for the tourism, and that is、uh, one of the things that people are getting or recovering from the COVID.、Mm-hmm. In the foreseeable future, I believe there will be greater changes in China's tourism industry by 2024, as you said, with diversified consumption in this industry. Gentlemen, our next buzzword is Village Super League or the Cunchao football game, a phenomenon that kicked off in 2023 in Guizhou, achieving record attendance and about. 600 million online viewers and generated nearly 6 billion yuan, or around 847 million U.S. dollar, in tourism revenue. Let's explore the cultural and social implications of this village-based sports league and how it has captured the attention of millions. Dr. Zhou, how do you perceive this phenomenon of village super league gaining such immense popularity in China? I think that it has attracted so many attentions from, not only from the people but also from the the media, and there are、so、many kind of the cast, and the people are really do that by themselves. So as they are really providing so many the the forces or energies to the people involved in, and no matter basketball or football, they are really trying to have a better atmosphere to encourage the people to compete, to exercise, to have a better body and some. More skills.、So、they are trying to learn that from doing, from you know the short videos and other kind of、uh, sources. So they are really one of the very nice thing. I would say that、uh, it, it's coming from the the bottom. It's coming from the people themselves, not coming from you know just from the, the central government. So actually, I would say that is more sustainable、mm. for the form of the organization of the the sports like that. And it's really providing so many opportunities for the tourism. For the finance, for other kind of the food processing, and also many other services. So it is very important for a country like China to have a the solid basis, like for the football players all around the China, to have a better and a more choices for the for the national team to choose from. So actually, that is good news. I would like to look at that,、uh, you know, in the better ways of development in the next. Year or coming years. Yes, we hope there are more channels for the sports to select its players and more paths to develop. Mike, we know the United Kingdom is a country that has a deep passion for football. In light of the unprecedented attendance, what elements of Chun Chao do you believe resonated most with the public and contributed to its widespread attention? 
I think it's it's just the natural grassroots, local, local culture, local environment, very genuine, sort of honest, decent local people having fun, participating, sense of community. There's no pretense. It really is very natural, very fresh. I think that's what resonates with the people. And as you say, in the UK, we do have a similar pyramid, if you like, of football, but that it goes much deeper than other European countries where, where people will go, particularly at this time of year, particularly on, on uh, Boxing Day. It, it's very, very traditional to go to your local team, uh, even if it's a team that uh, uh, where the standard is not very, very high. It, it's part of the local community. So, so I think that's really what resonates. And I think it's related to the previous uh, point about tourism and travel and younger generations. Mm-hmm. My point I made there, I think younger people in particular are trying to become far more attached and find themselves, find their identity through their local culture and, mm-hmm. and the variety and diversity of local subcultures across China, which is so fascinating. And then football is really just a symbol of that. So I think that's what really is is coming out here that people across China are just fascinated by this this local event, the, the fact that it's attached to the, the local roots. It's fun. It's not commercial in any way, certainly not at the moment. There's no deliberate commercial objective there, and that makes it perhaps even more rewarding and uh, genuine. So I think that's why it resonates, and it doesn't surprise me, and I think it's absolutely brilliant. And as one of the panelists said, hopefully it can lead to the spread of, of the game at local level, where you know, China could really excel if, if, if that really took off. And football is a global game, which I've been following very, very closely, is wonderful. And quite a few famous footballers have actually endorsed it as well. Former England international Michael Owen sent a video message endorsing this as well. So it spread internationally. So I think it's about local grassroots culture and then wanting to, to be in touch with that more amongst Chinese, particularly younger generations. Mario, speaking of the charm of this game, it's understandable on a standard football pitch, players were bringing their A game, rainbow kicks, long free kick goals. One could naturally think it's an international football game, right? But these wonderful moments were brought by players come from various ethnic groups and from all walks of lives. Vegetable vendors, fish sellers, teachers, entrepreneurs. How do you think this diversity contributes to the unique charm and appeal of this event? Well, this unique charm at the local level is is real life. That's the two words that I think about. Everything, of course, in today's world, including sports, has been got become far too commercialized. But get in your car or even hop on the train. But you know, we have a car and we go outside of Shenyang and immediately we're out into the Nongjia Twin and Dujia Twin. We're out in the villages. And the local villages is where it's real life. And it's like you said, yeah, the, the really good football player is a, he's, he's a fish vendor. <laughs> everybody buys the fish from, you know, and everybody knows his personal story. And I have another personal story that isn't exactly the Sports Super League, but similar, where I, I was asked to shoot a documentary out in Sichuan many years ago because a local farm village guy had his family there in the middle of Sichuan which is, you know, the hinterland in the middle of far, far, far away from everything in the middle of the country. And his family, his parents dreamed of making it to the ocean to see the, to see the seaside. Mm-hmm. And actually it wasn't going to happen. You know, they were getting older and unhealthy and they really were not comfortable to travel. And this fella in Duyang built an ocean park in the middle of the countryside. He built this gigantic, beautiful water park, ocean park man-made lake and all kinds of water features. He brought the ocean to the people in the village and in the process created a couple thousand jobs and revitalized the area. It's a wonderful local story, real life. Yes, the Sun Chao football game or the sea park you just mentioned seem to be more than just a sport or a park. It's a celebration of community and culture and a show of this villager's passion in life. The finally, gentlemen, as we've been talking about today, the buzzwords for China 2023. In summary, what image of China do you discern through this identified popular buzzwords? And what's your buzzword to define China in the past year? 
Yeah, I agree that these are really very important buzzwords. And uh, uh, I I would say that in my understanding, maybe there are two other words maybe it's also very interesting. Mm -hmm. In 2023, the first one is uh, recovery, and that is a very important year for the recovery of the economy and also the openness. And the second of the buzzword is uh, artificial intelligence or chat GPT related. Uh, models. I, I do believe that these things is changing or has changed a lot about the industries and sectors in China and around the world. It's really important. So the buzzwords are really some of the signals that we can find for the people to to identify their life. And that is a very interesting year. And I, I hope that next year there will be more buzzwords happening or mm -hmm. appearing. Oh, uh, Mike, what's your take? Do you want to add any buzzwords mm. to 2023 yes. for China? I, I think that what underpins everything here that we've discussed and the phrase I would go for, and, and you do see this in, in the, the, the media more and more, and that phrase is cultural confidence. And I think that's sweeping across China and has been for, for quite a few years now. And I think not just younger generations, but there's a renewed desire, confidence in local culture, expressing yourself through that culture and participating in that culture. So we've talked about it with tourism, with the Village Super League. So cultural confidence, I think, is, is a real genuine trend amongst Chinese people and consumers. And, and with that cultural capital, then taking that and almost sort of wrapping that up as a brand, that will then promote Chinese brands internationally. So we're seeing it more with, again, my area in fashion. But so cultural confidence, I think, is really a marked change that uh, has, is quite quite long overdue, but, but is there now, this sort of um, this fascination with this rich history and diversity across the country is something that um, I think will just grow and grow and grow internationally. So cultural confidence. Cultural confidence from Mike AI and recovery from Dr. Joe. Mario, what's your buzzword for China in 2023? What can we learn about Chinese cheating society from it? My word has to be a very old, the old traditional kind of word. I don't have a fancy buzzword, and it's just the word peace. It's remarkable to me that this country has not only risen up to become such a, a global superpower, but also a remarkable country domestically, but that it has done so in peace. This is an unprecedented experience in the history books. It's never happened before. It's absolutely amazing, and it's a gift to mankind. Peace. Thanks, Mario, for bringing attention to the word peace as a defining theme for China in 2023. With that, we conclude today's discussion. Thanks to all of our guests for their enlightening perspectives and delightful observations. This is the Chat Lounge with me, Anna. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye for now.